well, welcome to this talk about osteries. I've called it Funny Bones. Um, so there's going to be a lot of different stories coming into tonight. Um, osteries are I mean, Sam was talking about tangents. I think osteries are kind of a, a tangent to um, some of the, the goth, other gothic subjects that have been going on in this series. But I think that they in many ways encapsulate a number of the motifs that you find in the gothic. Um, gothic tropes such as nightmare, decline and decay, uh, omens and portents. Um, and an ossuary really acts as one of the least questionable importance imaginable, um, showing us our own inevitable end. And a few people are without fear of the mystery of death, though um, certain Gothic authors like Shelley, um, Stoker for example, will tell us that death is not necessarily the end. Um, but a visitor to, the, to an ossuary is confronted between, uh, by the juxtaposition, juxtaposition between their own living being and the death that they see there. Um, you know, the real reality of the way that our body will decompose, become skeletonized and end up as these kind of bones. And this can echo the fear and the apprehension that Gothic fiction can induce. Um, and Gothic fiction has certainly played with that juxtapos juxtaposition, for example, in Matthew Lewis's The Monk, where Antonia awakens from a drugged sleep into a crypt where she's surrounded by decomposing corpses. Uh, Ambrosio observes by the side of three putrid, half-corrupted bodies lay the sleeping beauty. And he gazes on their rotting bones and disgusted figures who perhaps once were sweet and lovely. And this kind of anticipates what Poe would go on to say about the death of a beautiful woman being one of the most poetical topics in the world. I'm just going to share my screen at this point. Oh, this is being slow. Spinning wheel, we'll get there. La la la, talk amongst yourselves. Um, here we go. Still thinking about it. Oh, here we are. Hopefully you can all see that. So, so this idea of uh, the way that beauty will end up um, decaying and dying makes me think of this uh, 16th century illustration by Sebald Behem, Death and the Standing Naked Woman. And this uh, plaque at the side uh, says, um, I'm not going to read it in Latin, but the translation is death destroys human beauty. And osteries can function on several levels. Uh, practical storage solution, morbid curiosity, and an important way to interact with the dead and contemplate our own mortality. Really, what can be more gothic than an ossuary? Uh, so this is the context in which I want to give you a history of ossuaries. Um, this is also effectively just my holiday photos as well. Um, and the idea of displaying bones, um, we really can begin with this quote, which can be found over the, uh, in the Capuchin Crypt in Rome, which we'll talk about later. That which you are, we were, and what we are, you will be. So, this is reminding us of our death. And it really harkens back to um, this idea of the, the, three, the three dead and the three living, which was seen a lot in the medieval period. And this is from the Psalter of Robert de Lille from the 14th century, where you've got the three kings facing the three dead kings. The skeletons are mirroring the, um, the positions of the living figures. And it's this kind of, this memento mori this reminding us about death that we can see repeated over and over within osseries. But I want to take you now to Paris. Not the Paris we know today, this is Paris before the Eiffel Tower, Paris before Baron Haussmann has redesigned its streets to make those grand boulevards. It's even Paris before the revolution. This is Paris of the 1770s and it's a city which has a problem with the dead. 
The saint Innocent Cemetery was one of Paris's many overcrowded burial grounds. It had been in existence since the 12th century. But by the point when Victor Hugo, Hugo's Quasimodo was pursuing Esmeralda through the streets of Paris in 1482, it's already started to recycle its graves. So for over 100 years by that point, it had been digging up bodies that had become skeletonized and putting the, uh, putting the bones along charnels at the edge of the graveyard. So this is an image from around 1550. You can see the, uh, the, the open ground of the cemetery where the people are buried, but around the walls, there are these charnel houses. Here's another image where they're storing the bones. And the charnels are decorated you can see at the back there these images of the dance macabre, the dance of death. And these were done in 1424 during a time of uh, an Anglo-Burgundian alliance, which took place after the death of Henry V of England and Charles VI of, um, VI of France. And this is one of the earliest known dance macabres, which would become uh, a very, very common image in Western Europe. Uh, for the next couple of hundred years. And the idea of the dance macabre is it's showing you the universal, universality of death. It pictures a skeleton representing death, leading away leading fi uh, living figures. And here, uh, this is a late 15th century version of the dance of death where we can see the, pope, uh, the king and the cardinal, but it takes you right down to peasants and farmers and uh, knights, warriors, all the way up to the pope. It's showing you that this happens to everyone. And as an anatomist, one of the things that I love about these charnels um, along the walls is the way they feed into anatomical history as well. Because there was an anatomist called Andreas Vesalius uh, in the 16th century, who he was from Amsterdam, but he studied in Paris for a while. And while he was in Paris, he went to these charnels and studied the bones. And he noticed how they were different from what he was being taught uh, at the university. Uh, he also uh, was possibly doing some dissections on bodies that he dug up in the graveyard, a little bit of grave robbing, which would have helped with the overcrowding. Um, but he took those ideas, he took what he'd noticed, and he, they fed into his De Fabrica, his On the Fabric of the Human Body, uh, which was published in 1543 and revolutionized anatomy. This is something I can talk about for a long time. But to get back to ossuaries, um, the ossuaries were crowded. By the 18th century, it reached crisis point. There were so many graves that ground level Sorry about this folks, we had a technical problem this morning as well. Um, hopefully Kat will be back with us in a minute. <laughs> Do you just have a small break? Yeah. <laughs> we can hear you again guys, by the way. Ah, okay. Excellent. My, my tech support came rushing through. What, what point did I stop at? Um, I can't remember. <laughs> oh no. So I've already seen the whole thing. The fabric of humanity. You just said about Vesalius. I just said about Vesalius. So anyway, uh, in the 18th, 18th century, the overcrowding in Paris had reached a crisis point. Um, 90,000 bodies were thought to be buried within the last 30 years of saint Innocent's existence. Um, mass, bodies, uh, mass graves containing between 12 and 1500 bodies. The ground had been raised by two and a half meters. And this overload of the dead led to unsanitary conditions. It was said that in adjacent houses, broth and milk went sour in a few hours, that wine turned to vinegar. Crisis came in 1779, uh, when a mass grave was dug for 2,000 corpses. A few months later, in 1780, a basement collapsed in the Rue de Langerie uh, that adjoined the cemetery, and corpses tumbled higgledy-piggledy into the basement. Obviously, people were not going to put up with that kind of thing. And on the 4th of September, 1780, an edict forbid, forbade further burials within the walls of Paris. But what could you do 
with this unsanitary place. And it wasn't just saint Innocent. Paris had other cemeteries with similar problems. The stench of cadavers could be smelt in almost all churches. The reek of putrefaction continued to poison the faithful. But this wasn't the only problem that Paris had. You see, to the south of Paris, there had been a number of quarries. This was the stone which Paris was built from. But as the city spread out, Paris started to lie all over those quarries and they'd been so heavily dug that they started to sink holes started to appear, but the streets would collapse inwards. And so they decided that they had to basically retrospectively put foundations into those quarries, put pillars in to support them. And in 1777, a man called Guillermont was appointed to oversee this. And he was known as the man who saved Paris. So you've got lots of quarries in need of uh, support. You've got lots of bones which need a place to go. Let's put the two together. And that's exactly what happened. But this wouldn't be the first burial that was associated with this area of Paris. Um, in the medieval times, this was known as the Tom d'Issoir, the um, Tomb of Issoir, who was a Saracen giant who was alleged to have been slain on this spot. And he caused lots of trouble um, assailing travellers going to and from the city. And near the catacombs, you will find uh, a Rue de la Tom d'Issoir. And there's a, a lovely depiction of him. I think this is a local school. So they sanctify the land of the, um, of the, the quarries and the transfer of the dead begins. The sanctification took place on the 7th of April, 1786, and nightly press processions began. Carts draped in black would move the dead through the city, escorted by priests chanting the offices of the dead. It took 15 months to empty saint Innocent. The conditions were such from the uh, huge amount of um, mass graves in there that not all the bodies had turned into bones. You see, there's a thing that if you crowd lots of bodies like that into a grave, oxygen can't get in. I mean, you don't tend to think there being oxygen under the ground. There's certainly not enough for a living person who's buried down there to be able to breathe, but it's enough for bacteria. But when you've got all these bodies crammed together, those bacteria can't get oxygen. And so decomposition doesn't happen in the normal way. You get a process called saponification, where fats in the body will turn into fatty acid salts. And these will form a kind of cheesy material uh, that over time will harden and become brittle, and this can actually preserve the body. So this is the soap lady, um, who you can find in the Mutter Museum in Philadelphia, who's been preserved by this thing called adipocere, or grave wax. This tends to happen more with um, women and children because they have higher proportions of fat in their body, for the most part. And as I say, this stuff is called adipocere. Uh, this was actually named by two of the medical men who were overseeing the uh, exhumations, uh, Fuqua and Touré, and it comes from the Latin adepts of fat and seer meaning wax. And they didn't want to transfer all this kind of goopy um, grave wax over to the catacombs, so what they did was they collected it up, it was made into soap or candles, and it was sold near the gates. Um, so saint Innocent was just one of the many cemeteries who the bones were taken over to what would become the catacombs of Paris. But shortly afterwards, the French Revolution comes along and the catacombs containing their bones were abandoned. But in 1809, a man called uh, Louis-Etienne Francois Hericot de Thury was employed to reorganize the bones. Initially, they'd just been laying in stacks and uh, they were just this kind of um, sort of mess of bones that were just arranged according to which cemetery they came from. But de Touré carefully stacked the bones. He made funerary decor with them. Uh, there were many plaques, including this really famous one above the entrance, which says, stop, here is the empire of death. Uh, and this is the kind of thing that happened. We get these bones arranged, they're an amazing, um, 
sort of architectural formations. There are plaques telling you which cemetery the bones came from. So this is the one for Saint-Saëns. There are quotes, uh, death-related things just to inspire you as you're walking around. And here, making these sort of cornicing around the crosses. And the visitors, um, the visitors to the uh, cemetery uh, were plentiful from the beginning. Uh, an initial visitor was, uh, sorry, I dropped my notes. An initial visitor was Francis I of Austria, who turned up in 1814, and Napoleon III came along in 1860. The last bones went into the catacombs in 1859, and this was with Baron Haussmann's renovation of, of Paris. As they were digging up streets, they would discover old graveyards that had been covered over, and those bones would go into the catacombs too. During the siege of Paris in 1870, people allegedly took refuge in the catacombs before they were found in a manhunt. And although the catacombs are the largest underground necropolis in the world, around 60, 6 million skeletons, they cover no more than 1 800th of the, the, the tunnels that uh, exist in this quarry. Someone that I spoke to recently talked about the fact that she didn't like the catacombs of Paris because she felt that, that they took away the individuality of the people down there. And I think that's kind of the point. I think they're meant to function like those dance of death motifs that we looked at earlier to show us that death comes to everyone. It's the great leveler. It doesn't matter who you are in life and death, you're just gonna become one of these skulls. One place which uh, does try to produce, uh, uh, um, retain the individuality of the bones though, is Hallstatt in Austria. Hallstatt is a very, oh, there's nothing. Hallstatt's a very beautiful village that sits on the edge of a lake um, and it's just a narrow piece of land, um, land between this alpine lake and these vertiginous mountains. There's not a lot of room. Burial space was at a premium, so people only were buried for a maximum of 15 years before being dug up and put in a bine house, a bone house. And families would be grouped together within the bone house, and at some point in around 1720, somebody decided to paint their loved one's skull, and it became a tradition within the town. Usually you would get the name, often the dates, uh, sometimes the occupation. They started off fairly simple, but over time they evolved so that um, you would get wreaths of laurel representing valor, oak and ivy for men, flowers for women. And it really is a beautiful place. And when you look closely, you can see the similarity of the surnames, how you get little groups of them together. So families are staying together. Um, the last person to be interred, well, to be put into the bone house at Hallstatt was a woman who died in 1983, and this was her last wish. And you can still see her skull with its gold tooth in there. Um, and I really love this, this is the door into the bone house. Um, so in Hallstatt, the skull and its decoration acts kind of in the same way that having a, a headstone would, the skull becoming the person's own very beautiful memorial. So these are two very, very different ossuaries. Uh, they're doing different things, they're having different purposes. The word ossuary comes from the Latin for bone and it's kind of interchangeable with the word charnel. Um, but they've been around for a long time. In the Christian, tradi Christian tradition, they've been around since about the sixth century. Uh, and by the 13th century, they're fairly ubiquitous in Western Europe, particularly in Austria, Bavaria, uh, the Upper Rhone, parts of Italy and France. So the idea of storing bones um, wasn't unusual. It really came from the fact that in the Christian tradition, you were supposed to be buried in consecrated ground. So usually you, you, uh, the bone house uh, would be still on the same consecrated ground that you would have been buried in. Obviously the, the catacombs of Paris is a slight exception to that. But between the 16th and 19th century, a lot of places decided that they wanted to make these ossuaries, these bone houses, 
a bit more special. And an example of this is San Bernardino in Milan. Um, San Bernardino, uh, again, it comes as a way of storing, uh, of storing bones when the space was running out. It was, for, uh, it was the cemetery for a hospital for lepers, um, the Ospedale de Bo del Brollo. And from 1210, the bronze began to be rehoused in an ossuary. The dead from this, um, uh, this leper hospital were cared for by an order called the Disciplinati. Now the Disciplinati were people who, they, they really had two functions in life. One was looking after the dead and the other was that every year they would have a procession where they went around town whipping themselves with knotted ropes. When the ossuary was destroyed by a, um, a tower collapse in 1642, they decided to do something a bit more special with the bones. Space was at a premium, so they built upwards. So this was a small space, but it was very, very tall. And they decorated the walls like this. They would use the skulls and the long bones and make them into these gigantic crosses with cornices of skulls. And it was, it's so tall, your eyes really, really go up to the ceiling in there. And it was believed that these bones were more than just to um, remind you of death and to remind you of the need to repent during life. These bones were also thought to actually help people. They were thought to be particularly good with controlling the weather or improving people's health. And so people would make offerings to the bones to help with things like this. And these offerings allowed the painting of this beautiful uh, fresco by Sebastiano Ricci in 1695, The Triumph of Souls and Flying Angels. And this is at the very, very top of this um, very tall ossuary. The order of the Disciplinati was disbanded in 1786, but they had conti continued to care for the dead of San Bernardino since then. And it's believed that the arrangement of the bones and ossuary has been pretty consistent since then, that not much has been changed since the late 18th century. Or has it? Because San Bernardino has a tale to tell, because it's said that every All Saints Day, the entire skeleton of a young girl that lies to the, light, the, right, uh, the left of the altar will rise. She'll make a gesture and all these bones will come together to make their former person. And these will join the young girl skeleton in a dance macabre, a dance so frenzied that the, the clattering of the bones is said to echo through the streets of Milan on All Saints Day. And San Bernardino had influence. Uh, John V of Portugal visited this ossuary and was really, really impressed. And he went back to his home country and he talked about this. And there was an ossuary in the town of Evora. Uh, some bones from local graveyards had been uh, put into a monastery. It's said that this was because the local nobles wanted to use the land of the graveyards for hunting. So the bones had all been put into the ossuary and John V suggested that maybe they would like to do something like they had in Milan with the bones. And so this is Evora. Uh, here the bones are um, actually um, uh, embodied in the wall of the church. They're actually uh, um, embedded in there. And it was also known as the uh, Caso de Sanguano, or the House of Disillusion. And a 1728 account says that it was meant to inspire repentance. The same account also describes Austria as looking pretty much as it does now. And here we can see um, the uh, inscription above the lintel here, which is, we bones that are here, we wait for yours. You know, which is kind of, it's a bit creepy. But again, this was meant to be the uh, idea that it was to remind you that death is coming for you and you should repent in life. It was also thought that this was a place where the living could go to intercede on behalf of the, death, the dead. In the Catholic tradition, there was the idea that you would go to purgatory after you died and prayers of intercession by the living could... Um, Reduce your time in purgatory before you could then ascend to heaven. 
and it was thought that the Osteria of Avora was a thematically appropriate place to do that. Um, I just have, can you still, oh, there we go. It's just being slow. So here are some of the bones in Avora. Avora doesn't just have bones though, it's got mummies as well, which is, you know, you know, that's like striking the jack jackpot. There's, a, there's a, a male mummy and a child, and we don't know exactly who they are, but as usual, there are legends. One legend says that this was, these were um, a father and son. Uh, the father had beat his wife and the son was disrespectful to his mother and they died and she cursed them for what they had done to her. And so when the grave diggers tried to bury the bodies, um, the ground was too hard. They couldn't go into the earth and were just left out into the, in the sun where they mummified. And they were put into this ossuary to remind people um, not to do similar things. These were to act as a warning. Portugal actually has quite a lot of bone decorated buildings. I think it's said to be the highest concentration of bone decorated buildings in the world. And possibly my favorite ossuary lies not too far from Evora. Um, oh, this is another couple from Evora. I love this little sort of angel made out of um, a pelvis here. But possibly my favorite is Campo Maior, which is on the border between um, Spain and Portugal. And Campo Maior, uh, it got its ossuary as a memorial. It was as the result of a terrible thing that happened in the town. Because it was a border town, this was a garrison. Uh, the, the main tower was used as a powder magazine holding 90,000 kilograms of gunpowder and 5,000 munitions, which is kind of an accident waiting to happen. And this is exactly what happened uh, in 1732, where at 3 a.m. on September the 16th, the tower was struck by lightning. Now, I've been assured that um, 500 grams of gunpowder has the capability of firing an anvil 200 meters in the air. So if that's what 500 grams can do, you can imagine what 90,000 kilograms can do. Of the, two, uh, of the 1,076 houses within the town, uh, 836 were destroyed. Two thirds of the town's inhabitants were killed. And the only thing to do with that many um, deaths was to dig a mass grave and put them all in. Um, and so uh, 34 years later, the bones were dug up and they were arranged in this amazing ossuary. Uh, and this was to act as a memorial for the people who had died on that night in 1732. So you can hear, see here, this is the roof with uh, the sort of the um, bones in the, uh, actually in the ceiling and these um, uh, cornicing of skulls, all the lintels there. It's a fabulous, fabulous place. And the, wall ha the walls have five, uh, four skeletons around them. Um, and as I said, I'm an anatomist. So one of the things that I noticed looking at these skeletons is they're not proper skeletons. Uh, if you look closely at the lower legs, those are femurs, which are thigh bones. Uh, and the feet, they're ribs. So not anatomically correct. But so this ossuary is acting as a memorial, and as I say, it's really beautiful, but this is something that's actually continued into the 20th century. Uh, this is Dumont ossuary in France, uh, which is at the site of the Battle of Verdun, where 230,000 people were killed in a very short time during World War I. So the bones here are piled into the ossuary, and you can look through windows to see these bones, just to try and comprehend uh, the sheer numbers of people that were killed during this terrible, terrible war. Just to go back to Portugal, as I said, they have a lot of bone decorated buildings, a lot of ossuaries, and the smallest one is this wee one in Monforte, uh, which is not that far from um, Campo Maior. Uh, 
not many people, not, not much is known about it, uh, even where the bones came from, but presumably this was grave recycling in the local very small cemetery. Uh, but the decoration seems to have been inspired by the fame of Evora. Uh, and here, the, you know, this, this room is absolutely tiny. You can just kind of peer in through the, um, through a grill at the front. You know, it's just a small room to go in and have, you know, private prayer, but beautiful, beautiful arrangement of the skulls and the femurs in the walls there. So some Portuguese ossuaries. We've talked so far about ossuaries in a very, very Catholic context. Um, but in the 16th century in Europe, there's a wee thing that happened called the Reformation. Um, and people know a lot more about this than I do. I'm not going to go into any great detail about the Ref Reformation. Um, but just a quick summary for anyone who doesn't know that much about it. It's kind of like taking Marie Kondo to your religion. You know, does this church corruption spark joy? Nope. Out it goes. And there was a lot of the, um, the pomp and ceremony of Catholicism that went out with the Reformation. And one of the things they really didn't like was ossuaries. They're kind of messy. You know, they're a bit... Um, you know, they're, you might see them as some form of ancestor worship. There's, they didn't like them very much. And so you tend not to see many ossuaries in Protestant countries. Um, either they have, if they were earlier ossuaries, they've never really survived. They tended not to make new ones. But there are a couple of exceptions, places where you can see them. Um, and one of those is on the south coast of England. And this is the ossuary of Hythe in the Church of St. Leonard's. We don't really know where the bones come from in this ossuary, though there are a lot of stories. Some people tell us that they go back to 1066, that these were people who were killed at the Battle of Hastings. Some people tell us that they were Danish pirates uh, or Anglo-Saxons killed in battle. Another suggestion tells us that these are people who died in the Black Death uh, or various other plagues that happened over the years. It seems to me that the most likely explanation of where these bones came from is that they were um, from a 13th century expansion of the church. The church had been made bigger, Bo uh, graves that were up against the wall would have to be dug up to make, make room for the foundations, and so the bones had to go somewhere. What's really unusual in the, con the context of England is the fact that uh, this ossuary has actually been maintained uh, right up until the present day. It was never closed off or abandoned or, you know, any of those things that would usually happen, but they were quite happy to keep going looking after these bones. Um, an interesting thing that you'll see at the ossuary of Hythe is you'll notice amongst all those skulls that one of them is a wee bit yellow. And this comes from the fact that one local inhabitant decided that he would nick one of the skulls. And he stole it, he took it home, he put it on his mantelpiece. He showed it to all his friends when they came round. And when he died, everyone knew where it came from, so it got returned to the ossuary. And the thing was, this guy had been a really heavy smoker. So it ended up a very nicotine stained skull. But talking about Protestant, oh, oh and I was also gonna show you, one of the skulls has also ended up being used as a nest, which always seems really nice. And it seems to um, just say something quite nice about the, the transience of life and death and the interaction between the two, it seems, very good to see that in an ossuary. But talking about Protestantism, I, it makes me want to go into something which isn't bones outside churches like these ossuaries us, uh, usually are, but bones inside churches. I just want to digress briefly onto the subject of relics. Uh, relics are usually things that are associated with saints, um, sometimes it's things they've been in contact with, sometimes in the case of the 
breast milk of the Virgin Mary, it's things that they, be, that they produced. And so many churches uh, are said to hold vials of the Virgin Mary's breast milk. But John Calvin said there is no town, however small, no monastery or nunnery, however insignificant, which does not possess it, some and less, others in greater quantities. Had Mary been a cow all her life, she could not have produced such a quantity. And this is something you can see quite a lot in relics. You know, there are a lot of skulls of John the Baptist around the place, that sort of thing. But relics were one of the things that um, Protestants really, really didn't like. Um, they thought that you can commune directly with God, that you could talk to God yourself. Whereas for the Catholics, they thought that you needed to go via the Pope or the priest or the relics of a long dead saint. They thought that they could use the uh, relics to intercede on behalf of God uh, if they needed something. They also thought that being close to them would, you know, they would get them some kind of bonus come judgment day, you know, that they would get swept up along with the saint, because obviously the saint's going to heaven. So if you're near a saint or a bit of a saint, then you, can, you might go along too. And the thing was that when the Reformation swept through Europe, they got rid of a lot of relics. And in some parts, particularly in areas of Austria and Bavaria, areas of Switzerland, they decided that they quite liked Catholicism and they'd like to go back to that. But they didn't have any relics. Uh, and you can't just get, get hold of new relics willy-nilly, can you? I mean, where would they come from? Well, it was lucky. Because in 1578, vineyard workers on the Via Salaria in Rome discovered a passageway which led into an old Christian catacomb burial ground. And they noticed that some of the skeletons down in this old burial ground um, had M's marked near them. And so they kind of start to assume that these must be martyrs. You know, not that it might be just somebody called Marcus or something like that, but these must be martyrs. And while they're not saints, they have a similar kind of status to their saintly brethren. And so they decided that these uh, martyrs could become replacements for some of the, the relics. And it's been estimated that more than 2,000 of these holy bodies crossed the Alps to repopulate churches that were denuded of relics during the, the Re Reformation. And one aspect of the counter-reformation was a tendency to go slightly over the top. You know, if you're playing my religion is better than your religion, you want to make, make sure people are noticing. And so the town of Valsassen received its first skeleton in 1688, St. Diodatus. And in 1721, a nun named Frau Magdalena Sudderin uh, started to make a jeweled costume for this skeleton. Uh, and he was so popular that the church acquired another nine skeletons from Rome by 1765. And these were decorated by the Mon Monastery's Apothecary, Ad 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 Adalbert Ader. Um, the four standing skeletons are bedecked in these kind of Roman gladiator garb, but with their added jewels. So you can see they've got these kind of fabulous lace-up sandals going up the front of their legs. These were jeweled warriors, um, you know, overwhelming the enemy with their displays of wealth. Uh, and I'll show you some more. So there are reclining figures in Valsassen as well. Um, he looks very casual, doesn't he? Um, and just look at it. I mean, these, how much jewellery, how much effort has gone into the costuming of these skeletons is just fantastic. However, you get to the end of the 18th century, these aren't fashionable anymore, times have moved on. Um, this was the age of enlightenment and um, man was ruled by reason rather than superstition. And Emperor Joseph II of Austria wanted rid of these false idols. He decreed that any relic that couldn't prove its provenance uh, should be disposed of. And a lot of the, um, these holy bodies had a fairly dubious pedigree. Uh, so not many of these supposedly around 2,000 have actually survived and Valsassen is one of the places where you can still see them. So you can see the way that the Counter-Reformation made Catholicism, which was already 
fairly over the top, go even more over the top. It was turning the dial up to nine. Um, and you can really see this in ossuaries as well. So, I mean, San Bernardino is fairly over the top. When you get to the Capuchin Crypt in Rome, things are even more so. Um, it was divided into six, uh, six rooms, and each room had a sort of, had a theme. And the idea was that these, uh, this would be a place where you could go to contemplate death. Um, for the Capuchins, they were following the idea of St. Ignatius Leola, who said that you should do spiritual exercises where you forgo pleasure and cultivate sorrow and contemplate death. And so this was what the Capuchin crypts were for. And they're amazing. These rooms are really, really small, but every surface is covered with something. And there are chandeliers. You can see here, this is uh, the, the, um, the coat of arms of the Capuchin order, which has been, re excuse me, recreated in uh, mummified arms, as you do. Uh, here we've got the Crypt of the Skulls. So this was a place where you could go and contemplate death. Somewhere you could think about your sins and how you had to repent in this life. Um, and this is a really difficult thing, I think, for us to think about in our largely secular world, because this wasn't just about um, reminding us of our own death. This was also a promise. By taking these bodies apart and reassembling them into something greater, um, this is acting um, to tell us about transcendence and what's going to happen when we get to ascend to heaven. So again, the crypt of the pelvises, and here in the crypt of the um, the three skeletons, we've you know we've got the star of the show. We've got this figure uh, where you've got a sort of grim reaper himself wielding a scythe, which is made of metatarsals and fibulae. So just amazing. It's a beautiful, beautiful place. It's absolutely tiny um, in a way that you don't expect just from seeing the photos. But not all ostentation in ossuaries is entirely down to the actions of the church. Second only in fame to the catacombs of Paris is Sedlik in the Czech Republic. And you can see here you've got, um, you've got a monster and a goblet made out of bones. And while this is churchly decor, it wasn't done by um, a church order. So what happened in Sedlik was that um, it became a very popular place for burial. In the 13th century, Abbot Henry from the monastery at Sedlik travelled on pilgrimage to the Holy Land. And he brought with him a handful of soil that was alleged to come from the site of Golgotha. And he scattered that in the ground around the monastery and that meant that everyone wanted to be buried there. All the, all the, um, all the uh, rich people from Bohemia and around, they wanted to die and be buried amongst the soil from the Holy Land. And more than 30,000 people were. And soon, it wasn't long before, there simply wasn't enough room for everyone to rest in peace in the earth there. And so they would start to, as we've said many times, to recycle the graves. Several centuries later, a powerful family called the Schwarzenbergs acquired the monastery and the land around it. And they um, paid a woodcarver called Franchet Print to arrange the, um, the bones within the, uh, within the church there. And this is what he did. Here we've got the Schwarzenberg family coat of arms. And in the bottom corner there, you will see a raven pecking out an eye. And this is uh, meant to be a, a raven pecking out the eye of a Turk because one of the Schwarzenberg ancestors had been involved in the defeat of the Ottoman Empire in the 16th century. Here we've got things like this chandelier, which is two and a half meters across, um, said to be inspired by the Capuchin Cemetery in Rome, and also said to contain every bone in the human body. Uh, that's probably a better picture of it. And Rint was obviously so proud of his work that he even signed it, albeit in bones. 
Um, predictably, the way the bones were used like this drew criticism. A lot of people thought this was inappropriate, uh, with one English visitor lamenting that such an undesirable place could only exist because of the Protestants being ejected from the region. I just want to finish uh, by looking at a, a tiny little ostery that's not very far from um, Sedlick. 21 miles away is the uh, Church of St Peter and St Paul, and in the basement we've got the ostery of Melnick. Um, and this tiny little ossuary shows us a number of themes that we've seen while looking at ossuaries. So here, um, the top of it is kind of deteriorated a bit, but the words here spell out Eke Morse, behold death. So these words spelled out in skulls are again reminding us of, that we're going to die. This is a memento mori reminding us to repent in life. And here we've got uh, um, a corridor that's made out of long bones ending in a blank wall, which is meant to represent Christ's resurre uh, resurrection. Um, to show us that death is leading to eternal life. Another slightly interesting thing, uh, slightly disturbing thing about this ostrich is that it was actually arranged by an anthropologist. And he had some slightly dodgy theories about um, about the different peoples and so skulls that he believed were Germanic would face outwards and Slavic skulls would be made to face inwards. Um, so you know not such a good thing but I do think this uh, ossuary is very nice just it just acts as a synecdoche of all the other themes that we've looked at today. Um, con the contemplation of our life and our sins, the inevitability of death and a pledge of what may come afterwards. So that's a brief look at ossuaries. I'll just stop sharing that. So there we go. Thank you so much. It was just as fun for me. I love the fact there was a couple of different bits maybe as well. Um, <laughs> well done, yeah, it was amazing. Thank you so much. Um, so we didn't have any questions in the chat as we went through, I don't think. Um, I feel free to correct me, anyone, if I, if I missed a question. But this is a time now for people to jump in, ask any questions that you like. Um, we've got uh, 10 minutes until the class is up, but uh, Kat may be willing to stay a couple of minutes extra as well if you have a lot of questions. So yes, yeah, so have at it. You can write your questions in the chat or you can ask them out loud. Just uh, remember to turn your microphone on. If you are asking out loud. <laughs> no, no one. Silence. I love overwhelm people's bones. Typing speed. Oh, there we go. Yep. <laughs> Couple of questions. I don't know if you can see them. So one from Wes, how did you become interested in osteoids and the like? Um I'm just interested in dead things. Um, you know, I was a child that used to pick up dead animals when I was out walking my dog and take them home and cut them up on the kitchen chopping board, which is how I ended up becoming a human remains conservator. Uh, so yeah, um, anywhere I can go and look at bones, I love. And um, it, when I said about it being our holiday photos, uh, the vast proportion of Austrian pictures that I was showing you in there were ones that I have taken from my, from my travels. Not the Capuchin Crypt because that's, um, you're not allowed to take photos in there, alas. Uh, I think as of the end of last year, I don't think you're allowed to take pictures in uh, Sedlick either, um, mostly because they're trying to um, crowdfund a very expensive art book of photos, I think. Um, I see. Um, there's a question from Janie, which is, do we have any idea how many ossuaries might have been about in the UK before the no pomp for you police? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, no, we don't. Um, you know, that's the thing that if you take bones and bury them, they don't last all that long, really. Um, there certainly doesn't seem to be any signs of there being ossuaries in Scotland at all. And that's largely because our soil isn't particularly nice to bones so bones do eventually decompose um, 
how quick that happens to fit depends on the conditions that they're kept in. So in some places, bones can last thousands and thousands of years. You know, if you've got really uh, acidic soils, they may only last tens of years. So it really, really can vary in terms of in terms of numbers. Um, uh, so yeah, we don't really know about England. I mean, the ones that have survived, we've got Hyde on the south coast, we've got St Brides in London, and uh, Rothwell in York, Yorkshire. Um, but yeah, beyond that, it's very, very likely that a lot of places would have been recycling graves, especially in sort of, you know, small towns and the like. Um, certainly London is likely to have had more ossuaries, but who knows how many. Thank you. Um, a couple more questions. So Mari's asking, I was wondering about ossuaries destroyed for political reasons and any examples you can think of there? Ooh. That's a really good question. And I'm just trying to think if I know anything about that. I know that the, um, the Czech Republic, not so much political reasons, but um, unsanitary reasons, that there was um, a lot of ideas that, you know, these weren't good places. I think it was in the 18th century, though I might have my dates wrong on that, that um, I can't remem remember the name of the the leader either. I think it may have actually been Joseph II again, that they um, actually just walled a lot of ossuaries up. So Melnick, when we saw that the top, uh, the top layer of that, um, that quote in skulls was destroyed, that was because that had actually been sealed off and was only more recently reopened. So there was, there was some uh, sealing of ossuaries, not for political reasons, but for um, sanitation purposes. Mm. Um, but yeah, I, off the top of my head, I'm, I have to admit, I'm not thinking of anything, but I might just be overlooking something really, really obvious. Um, do you have any recommendations for books on ossuaries? <laughs> yes, I can recommend lots of books on ossuaries. Um, give me a second, I'll just grab them. I have library envy right now. Okay. The best book about ossuaries is this one, The Empire of Death by Paul Kudinaris. Um, and this is a massive book with loads and loads and loads and loads and loads and loads of beautiful, beautiful pictures. Uh, Paul Kudinaris is just amazing. Uh, if you're on Instagram, his Instagram, his Instagram is basically pictures of ossuaries and uh, weird death rituals and cats. Um, particularly his own cat dressed up. Um, so yeah, and he's also written a book called Heavenly Bodies, which deals specifically with uh, the, the skeletons, like the Valsassen skeletons, these, um, these sort of weaponized dual skeletons that, end, uh, that were part of the Counter-Reformation. So Paul Kudinaris is definitely good when it comes to uh, ossuaries. Um, the other thing is, uh, this is called Mos Pretiosa, and it's by an Italian man called Ivan Shenzi, um, who has written a, a fabulous series of books. Um, they're all dual language, so they're in Italian and English. And uh, most pretty was specifically deals with Italian religious ossuaries. Um, but he's also got a book about the Fontenelle Cemetery in Naples and uh, the man who petrifies bodies, um, Guarini in uh, Italy. So all his books are amazing as well. But yeah, they're definitely the ones when it comes to ossuaries. Um, and there is a question um, connected to your earlier comment about um, how you got into the field. Um, is a question is how does one pursue this interest academically and professionally? Ah, well, um, so I, I went from a child who was interested in cutting up dead things to uh, doing a degree in anatomical science. So that's what my undergrad degree is in. Um, my first proper job was uh, working in the mortuary. So I would remove people's brains and sew them up um, after autopsy, um, go into people's houses and lift people up when they died. Um, and I'd always wanted to work in a museum. So while I was still at university, I'd written to all the museums which hold um, anatomy collections in Scotland, just going, please can I come and work for you? Um, 
I always like to point out that Surgeons Hall never replied to me. <laughs> um, but I ended up working at the Hunterian Museum in Glasgow um, and they were very, very desperate at that point to have somebody to work on their collections and there wasn't anyone out there with skills. So I was just fabulously lucky that they were prepared to, for me to pay, pay, to pay for me to go and train to do these kinds of things. And that was 20 years ago now, so. Amazing. Thank you. Um, does anybody else have any more questions? Feel free to ask anything related at all. Um, pop them in the chat. I can ventriloquize you or you can ask out loud as well. <laughs> so if nobody has any more questions, what I'll just do now is say thank you again to Kat. Thank you so much. And I will stop the recording.